Hey folks, George Leoniak of New Geometry. I'm, uh, I'm more than thrilled to be back with another video. Super excited to uh, get into this one. This is gonna go back to really kind of how I got uh, into building forms uh, through the inspiration of Frank Chester's work. And this one's gonna be all on the Chestahedron, uh, a lot of it and some other little discoveries I've made along the way. Uh, so yeah, so Frank Chester, he created the uh, Chestahedron form. Uh, and uh, this is a book that's all about that. And it's actually interesting, I didn't realize, uh, but he called this one a new NEW sacred geometry. And of course, I'm KNEW sacred geometry. So yeah, pretty excited to uh, get into sharing his work and the discoveries that I've been making with that along the way. Um, we'll be referring to his book a little bit throughout. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty exciting form and uh, a lot of new discoveries that are associated with it. So as normal, I got a slideshow. I've got a bunch of uh, forms built here, you know, that I'll be uh, coming back to, chestahedrons um, marked up for various reasons. You know, here's the, here's the chestahedron type of shape. And, uh, you know, it has this kite face and the tri triangular face. It's got a, it's a seven-sided form. And, uh, you know, I'll talk about this in the video. Frank's, one of his goals with the form was to create an equal area for the kite face as well as the triangular uh, face here. And I'll be talking a lot about that because some of my discoveries are related to uh, that, um, that those equal areas. And so let's jump into the sharing screen here for the presentation I've got going on. And, you know, I, can't, I, I built hundreds of little chestahedrons early on when I was making forms. In fact, uh, you know, I made this little uh, lovahedron shape, I was calling it. Let me, let me stop the share real quick so I could show this one to you. So, I, I, you know, like I said, I was inspired by Frank's, Frank's work early on. And what I did was, you know, in the back of his book, he's got an image of the uh, chestahedron laid over a five-pointed star. So I, this is really like the first form that I made. I said, well, I'll just take four of those uh, kites of the star, fold it up and see what happens. And uh, I made a four-pointed uh, kind of projection out of that. And of course, his was made out of the, uh, the three. You know, this is actually the first one that I made. And I started grouping these together, you know, bottom to bottom, like a little double pyramid structure, realizing it was kind of making like an octahedron type of shape. And then in my other video, I said I started to put those together to create these larger forms. I talk about this in the dynamic steady state of uh, the universe model. So yeah, this one was actually the first little paper model I really ever made. It's actually made out of just construction, regular paper. Uh, before I moved on to some little bit sturdier materials. So yeah, that was some of my inspiration early on with the building of the forms, totally inspired by Frank's work. And uh, let me just show you that image in the back because it's a little template that he made in the back with the five pointed star there. So we're gonna refer to all that stuff again. Um, so now, now let me jump into the screen share. Because what I did here was I started to uh, apply the uh, golden hexagon to the triangular face. I was really curious. I have a whole video on the golden hexagon, which, uh, you know, there's, like I said in there, there's not really a lot out there. I built a bunch of other forms with the golden hexagon, like the truncated octahedron and a truncated icosahedron uh, and the, the, the tetrahedron. So, you know, here's the uh, golden hexagon on the tetrahedron. Here's that truncated version of the golden, uh, te the golden tetrahedron. Yeah, so I was, uh, you know, just kind of led to add the, uh, that, the shape because we've got triangular faces on the, uh, the uh, chestahedron. So just I wanna just, you know, briefly go over a little bit of the math, why I really uh, think that the golden hexagon is a really cool, is because the outer edges of the hexagon are in phi relationship with one another. We've got one to 1.618 over here. 
And this whole length here would be 2.618 with one inch on either side and the 0 0.618 in the middle. And then we also have the, um, this was cool too, because the inner uh, angle here that's going across the he hexagon or the inner line that's going across there, that was actually divided uh, into root two, meaning this segment here was root two and the reciprocal of root two over there. So that also was divided into phi and that whole length was the diagonal of a square that had a 1.618 edge. So that whole length, that blue line, which is the inner angle of a square with 1.618 edge is that length right there. So I just wanted to cover that just to show you that the golden hexagon has all these awesome mathematics in it. And here it is in this triangle. So now what I did was I, first of all, I constructed the chestahedron. Now this is where it kind of got really interesting for me because in Frank's book, I, I discovered that he, uh, his angles, he, he modified the angles of the kite faces. So if we take just that regular five-pointed star, and I always thought in the back of his book here, and maybe he did, where I show you his star pattern here, you know, how he does the star and shows you the form. But when I actually got into the book and realized in his mathematics, what happened was he modified the angles of the kite He's got a whole list here. Let me see if I could call that up, find the, he had someone do the, or, you know, he did it or someone helped with all the math of the chestahedron to find out the kite area. Cause he was trying to find out the kite of equal area. So in the book, it's on this back page, there's a bunch of measurements uh, and as well as angles. I noticed that his angle at the top of the kite was uh, 71.75 degrees. And if we're dealing with a star uh, of the pentagon shape, and as well as all the mathematics of phi based ratios to go with those um, star points, which is all based on phi for the five pointed star, is has to be 72 degrees. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be for the chestahedron the way he created it, but if it's a regular star of five points, well, that would be 72 degrees. His other bottom angle at the bottom of the kite face that he made was 36.49. So almost so 36.5 essentially. And he had to modify those kites, which of course is gonna change a little bit of the geometry of the equilateral triangle that I'm using and, the, uh, and as well as the angle of the kite face. And this is gonna have ramifications for how this structure is gonna fit into a lot of other things in sacred geometry. I'll show you towards the end of this video. But Frank had a specific goal with how he wanted to create this seven-sided form, creating these kite faces to equal area with the triangular faces, right? So it's got four triangles and three kites, and those are all equal area. His goal was to kind of put it into the same realm of like a platon the platonic solids. Of course, these all have different sized, uh, different shaped faces and different uh, meeting places at the vertices. So that was his goal. I I'm calling this, uh, it's still the chestahedron shape. It it's just, I'm gonna use the star and I'm gonna call it the golden chestahedron because I'm gonna keep that kite face in its regular star point for a regular five pointed star. And just, uh, you know, I didn't know what would happen. I realized, you know, would there be a little warping? Cause this, this little four pointed shape that I made here with the stars, there was an ever so slight bulge because that bent the uh, star petal there. And the, the kite, it kind of has a, a 178 degree angle there that uh, was very un in imperceptible to my eye when I was building it, but it messed up when I started putting them together, they wouldn't lay flat when I was able to do more accurate drawings. I realized that. Um, so anyway, the, the golden chestahedron totally works. You don't have to modify the angles at all. When you just take a five pointed star and fold it up in the three petals of it, those angles remain flat. So I just did the drawings here and they're all to scale. And then what I did was I applied the golden hexagon within it on the triangular faces. Now, 
I almost kind of backed out from going any further into there because I didn't really know what I was doing with like why I was doing this, like what was the importance of this. But, you know, I just kept going along and came back and revisited it. And I was like, well, what happens if I put a smaller little chest hedron at the bottom of this uh, triangle? So this is the base. And there's another triangle that would be in here. And that would be the base of this other chestahedron, little one, that's going up to the top. So then I realized, wow, well, the golden hexagon, the height of it, when it's in this formation, will actually be the midpoint of the whole chestahedron. So the golden hexagon divides, when it's on the triangular faces, divides the whole length, the whole height of the chestahedron directly in half which means that you could put a chest hedron here and above pointing down. And in fact, you could overlay two chest hedrons on top of one another so that the base of the one and touches the, the point and the bases touch for, for both of them essentially. And here are the little chest hedrons within there meeting at the center point. Um, so that was pretty cool discovery. And that kept me inspiration to kept going. So. You know, what I did then was I was said, well, let me see if I just create a little truncated version of this and cut it in half at that location and create a little chest adhesion. So I got a nice little surprise in this little box here, this little golden hexagon type box, because here it is. Here's this little truncated uh, version. This was the little start of it, the first one that I did. And this is based off of you can see how I just kind of truncated the chestahedron here. There's the hexagon faces that I just kind of figured out the math to nip off the ends, figured out that these were also dividing the line here into phi ratio. So did the whole thing around. And if I were to put a chestahedron at this halfway point, it would poke right out the top here and become complete the top of the chestahedron. So we have two chestahedrons within here. And then I made this little container, which is the bottom half of this form. And, you know, it's got a little lid on here. And then there's the little chestahedron inside, uh, Velcro down inside there. So, you know, this is the type of thing that I loved about Frank Chester's work that I said really inspired me because, uh, you know, he was just playing with the geometry, really working with the forms, letting them kind of move and, and kind of... Uh, uh, building transformations of forms and nesting things inside one another. But there it is down in, in this little uh, this little shape here, half of the half the chestahedron height, and we could stack another one on top and that would poke out of the top. So here's that little chestahedron. I'll pull that out. And there it is. And there's the little form that would be connected to. And this is the size of the chestahedron that it was contained within. So, you know, I don't really know, you know, what the significance of this little half form is. You know, I visualize packing those together. It's got a, quite a few unusual looking sided faces. Uh, nevertheless, it was qu quite an interesting exploration into the geometry of the chestahedron, of the golden chestahedron version, because I don't believe that will work out the same way with the modified angles that, uh, with those slight degree angles, as I've recognized in sacred geometry, really add up in the long run, just a, a, a half a degree difference will change the whole formation of the whole thing. So let's share the screen again um, and keep going on. So I then wondered about how could I uh, create the dual form? Let me, let me just show you, because Frank did create a dual form in here. He calls it the Decatria. Um, I believe that's a 13 sided form. And well, I realized I wasn't gonna be able to easily figure out how to make that because I, uh, here's, here's a version of it, something related to beehives. Um, I wasn't gonna be able to make that, this is it inside the dual form, because uh, of those slightly modified angles, I was just using you know the traditional forms that uh, didn't have, the equal area for those faces. I was just building it off of the star template. So I wondered what the dual form was going to be for the, what I created. 
So I went into, uh, you know, trying to figure that out. And I started dividing the whole chest dehedron here into different, um, different length, different truncations, basically. So each of these lines, the blue one right here is the golden hexagon blue one that I showed you. So this is the blue. This is not the line that's associated with it. I'll get to what that's about. So we've got this blue one, that's the golden hexagon. And then I figured out how to truncate the whole thing around based on those dimensions. This red one actually will divide the golden hexagon, I mean, not divide the, the, the face of the triangle into a, a, a regular hexagon with equal edge lengths. And that was in the middle. And then I found that there was one other division of the hexagon which was actually the reverse of the golden hexagon flipped over inside. And here is the long edge length, which would be in relationship to this lower edge length, which would be in the five. So I was like, well, you know, I'm showing you the chestahedrons in here, but I trying to show you how this mystery came about because I was like going through these little spots to see where will the points of a chestahedron. And the reason I'm showing you this view is because the chestahedron will be, uh, this is the long edge of the petal, and that's gonna contact one of these places along here. And similarly, it's gonna contact one of these truncated locations along here. And, cause that's a point that's horizontal to this plane. And then there's also up here, where's it gonna touch there? So as I'm going through there, you have to make sure that this length, which is through the midpoint, through the center of a triangle, this length, I had to make sure that when I take this measurement and bring it up to here, that it would be the same. Because basically this is a triangle pointing up and this is a triangle pointing away. So I went through all these little spots here until finally it clicked and I was able to find the length of the chestahedron, the one that's in here from this edge length, swinging it all the way up until it contacted the inner phi, the smaller phi, the black one here, the smaller phi relationship hexagon connected to the outer larger hexagon. And the middle one, which divides the length into thirds, that had even, uh, you know, that would create a regular size hexagon on this face, all equal edges around here. That was in between these two extreme, well, two, not extremes, but uh, the two divisions of phi ratio that went a little bit bigger and a little bit smaller. And what I had to do was connect the, the larger, uh, the blue one, which was the larger golden hexagon to the smaller one. And then the chestahedron magically fit inside of this new form that I created that was based on the, uh, this golden hexagon uh, relationships that are happening here between the smaller one and the larger one. And these points matched up. So um, I'll show you the form in just a moment. And as well, I did it from all the different views. Here it is before I've truncated off those sides. Uh, the, the, the corners of the chestahedron. And now this is the dual form of this golden hexagon because I'll be able to take uh, this shape, uh, another chestahedron and grow it around this and then go around the chestahedron with another one of the blue ones and the orange and those will oscillate back and forth. So yeah, it's a pretty neat way to come about it in discovery, but here's this shape here it is from this view, and this view is facing away from you. So this is the kite view with the truncated edges. Uh, this is the triangle view with the equilateral triangle, and this is that kind of side view. So here, let's take a look at the form before I go on a little bit more. And now you can see why this chestahedron that I've created here has all these ed uh, all these lines on it, which is actually a kind of very cool looking pattern to me to just see where these places would truncate the golden hexagon, uh, truncate the, the golden chestahedron. And the neat thing about this, and I'll get to this in a little bit, if 
you take this black line, the lowest one here, that now divides the chestahedron all the way around into equal edge lengths all the way around this. So if you were looking straight down on this and I got a picture coming up, that now is a perfect hexagon from above. And Frank did that with his chestahedron, with the version of chestahedron he was working with. And I've done the same thing with this one here. So there's the, uh, that, and now here's the truncated version of it. Um, and this also has a little flap at the bottom here. And it has the, you, all you really see, cause I can't pull the form out anymore, but you'll see that the chestahedron is in there. You just have to imagine that that corner point is, uh, here's the same size chestahedron, that that point is touching that flat triangular surface. So there's the chestahedron, the top is right at the bottom. And I mean, it's a, it's a pretty snug fit. I mean, it's really snug. I mean, it's not gonna wiggle around too much. I mean, I'm dealing with the paper. So I've got some, um, there's a little minor, minor movement and it wiggles around a bit in there, but it's uh, or, or really not at all. So, and that will just close up. And then that's just a regular golden hexagon that caps it off at the bottom. And these are now kind of these squished golden hexagons because I'm combining the base of the golden hexagon that's the base with the smaller golden hexagon on the top. So that was pretty cool just to kind of lead me down that discovery. And then, you know what I made here, which because of that hexagon, uh, this is just something I was playing around with. I have no idea what this is, but because there's that perfect hexagon at the base here, I decided to just say, hey, well, I can just create this shape. Uh, you know, for fun um, and have just the top point with the hexagon bottom. And I decided to make uh, two of those and just put those together, uh, hexagon to hexagon with now both of the top ends of the chestahedron. And this is kind of now an interchangeable form that you could put this way, or you could put, turn it this way. And I really have no idea what the significance of this form is, other than it divided into the into half here. Uh, it, it, it does that that doesn't divide the chestahedron in half because it's lower than that point. So this won't be the same height as a chestahedron. But this is just how the kind of fun of the creativity kind of takes shape as uh, you just see what happens. And and that's just, you know, I think how discoveries are kind of made with some of this thing, some of these things. So let's get back to the uh, golden hexagon, golden chestahedron slideshow here. And uh, so there's one other thing that I wanted to visit in Frank's book. Um, you know, he has something about the golden or his, the, the chestahedron. And, and, you know, there's a slight difference between the two because of that. And I don't know if this drawing is really accurate because he shows a picture of the chestahedron he created in the flower of life pattern. This is, you know, rotated, but it's got 19 circles of the flower of life here. And he shows how he constructs the chestahedron saying it integrates within it. And of course his version now is not gonna be based on phi because of those modified uh, kite faces that I said, once you modify these angles, uh, even the slightest degree, the 72 degree point here, which is 126 or this one down here, the 36.5, that's gonna warp this dimension. So this won't be uh, one point or 6.18 or 0.618 to one inch for the lengths. So I'm not sure in his modified version, if his version will fit the flower of life, it certainly could be. I'm not sure it will. I just think it's trying to fit in the pattern to the flower of life. And I've already talked about in a lot of my other video, how the platonic solids um, don't fit into the flower of life because it doesn't can divide the line into five. It continually divides the line into thirds all the way around. Um, so anyway, I set these two up to scale. This is one inch. And now I've, what I discovered here as well, the, the way to create the golden uh, 
chestahedron is to use the method that I've been describing through many of the last five or six or more videos that has to do with these two circles being in phi relationship, the inner circle to the outer, uh, the, uh, the inner circle to the outer circle here, that would be 0.618 to one inch uh, circles. So these, these two are in phi relationship, the two outer circles. This, this actually wouldn't be uh, 0.618 because we're taking the diameter. So basically the diameter of these two circles, what I'm trying to say, are in phi relationship. So it means these two triangles are gonna be in phi relationship. And magically, that is how you draw the chestahedron, the golden chestahedron of my view from the top view, looking down at it, will be drawing a tr equilateral triangle and then connecting that to the equilateral triangle of the smaller one. And that then creates the flared out edge that you need to draw in the chestahedron accurately from a top-down vertice view. So that is your view looking down straight away, just like that. And you see, you've got these flared out, that's the truncated one I did. Let me get the other one. Um, this is looking straight down on it like this. And so really you're getting these points up here and the bottom triangle. And so this, once again, this pattern, which I just do off of the seed of life and show in my other videos how to create, will create the golden hexagon. And of course that will, or the golden tetrahedron, sorry, golden chestahedron. I've, I've converted all these things into golden forms, I guess. Um, so the golden chestahedron has that same blueprint basically. Um, and, you know, I think that this blueprint, and I'm going to just step away from the chestahedron just a bit, because is really a big upgrade to how we go about creating these forms. Here is the, uh, accurately, and, uh, you know, this is based on the seed of life, and, you know, this is I'm just going to reference Trinvalo Melchizedek's book about how he went on and on and on for years and years trying to find out how to draw the dodecahedron in the flower of life. He finally came up with a method of how to do that, you know, in a workshop. Someone said, hey, well, what about if you just connect two lines? And this isn't it. This is the different version of this is how you do it accurately. And so he did that. And he's like, oh, there's the dodecahedron. And now we have a million gazillion images out there of the decahedrons based off of Metatron's cube, which are not in phi relationship because this edge right here is different than this back edge, meaning that if this is one, this is not 0.618. I did a video on how all the, the uh, platonic solids are not in Metatron's cube, primarily the icosahedron and the decahedron are not drawn accurately based on that. So here is a new version that actually does it so simply because the drawing of the smaller red to blue, which are the phi relationship circles nested in a bigger phi relationship circles. And you go around these little blue circles, the bigger blue circles, you know, they touch the red circles and then the blue circles, the red circles touch the blue circles. And that created this other petal pattern that you can see kind of going around here. And I just discovered this, you know, a few days ago because I've been drawing the flower, I've been drawing the dodecahedron with this model, but didn't discover this because it fits into this pattern too. All you have to do is just connect the dots. So if I draw a hexagon around this, just do the connection point between the center place of that petal. And this is more apparent when you draw the hexagon that would be framing this in. Um, you just connect that spot. And that then is the magic place to create the dodecahedron uh, with the accurate dimensions, the 0 0.618 to the one inch edge length. And why not, you know, let's not, you don't have to stop there because you can continue on and just show now that the dodecahedron is just um, in this pattern all the way out, you know? And this is something that the flower of 
the, the traditional version of the flower of life or, or fruit of life pattern will not do. Um, in my opinion, please show me or correct me if I'm wrong that this does do this with accurate dimensions all the way. So here essentially is another, a, a new version of the fruit of life based on these five relationship circles because the fruit of life, remember, has 13 circles that touch all the way out. And what, we've, what I've done here is that this has been modified into these five relationships, creating this whole network of petals in between here that are creating the spacing to create these dodecahedrons all the way out. Now, this doesn't have that petal, but this is the top of a hexagon. And this is the cross point of a star here that are creating these points that we're seeing all the way around. So if I filled this all in, you'd see where all the connecting lines are. But now all of a sudden, this was like the like a holy grail type thing for geometers is like, how do you draw the dodecahedron? Where do you find it in Metatron's cube? You know, and then all of a sudden, you know, we've got one version of it. And now here's a version that just fractally draws it out, three dodecahedrons, and I can do them in the smaller center circle here. And as we build this pattern out, we can continue on. And of course, the icosahedron, tetrahedrons, cube, uh, octahedron, all the platonic solids are in here. And then you'll be drawing the uh, rhombic triacontahedron in here. You'll be doing all that. Like, so all this is in there, um, including the chestahedron. And that was a real kind of, some discovery for me is like trying to figure out how Frank's work, the chestahedron, at least the golden chestahedron here now, fits into these patterns that of sacred geometry and bring it right into the new KNEW NEW geometry, uh, you know, that really has the potential to revolutionize many of the designs and patterns and buildings of the building of the forms based on sacred geometry from a lot of these new images that are being presented here. And that's what I feel about this type of, uh, these patterns are so, those patterns are so part of our uh, pattern language in our culture and we continue to evolve and grow and expand in our consciousness. So, you know, collectively our patterns will continue to evolve. And Frank is like in, in one of his videos he saw a long time ago, he was just like, we, we have to keep going, you know, we have to keep expanding, we have to keep you know, we're not set. And he would do things with the flower of life, like show how it can rotate and set all the, the circles up completely different. Well, this is another way to arrange the circles. And these are all now based on phi relationships. The inner circles, the small circles are all within phi relationship to one another. These larger circles, this one to this one's in phi relationship, and this one to this one's in phi relationship. And then now we have new patterns and new designs. This is one based on that snowflake patterns that I talked about in the golden hexagon about how the snowflake pattern contains the golden hexagon and the regular hexagon and how the width of it. But look, you know, now here's a kind of star points going around with the, the uh, you know, the smaller star in relationship to the larger star points to kind of create this weaving type of pattern. So, you know, this is a uh, pretty exciting stuff for me. And I hope that, uh, you know, you find this really interesting and that it becomes part of your pattern, pattern language if, you, if it resonates with you and start creating with some of the new, new designs and see how those resonate and influence um, how, you, how you relate with sacred geometry and what you start to see and unlock for yourself when you become more in relationship and communication directly with the form so they can teach you more fully what they have to offer. Um, so here is uh, a tiling pattern that I discovered this past week as well, that is of the golden um, hexagon. And I just started putting them together actually as I was creating the templates to create, you know, the golden chestahedron with the hexagons on the bottom, I started to piece them together. And then I was like, oh, wow, look, the hexagon regular, e you know, equal edge hexagon fits in right between all those golden hexagons. And you know that pattern will now just infinitely go on rather than the kind of chicken wire mesh that we see of just regular hexagons going on and on and on. All of a sudden we've introduced these five relationships because remember every single edge in here, these one inch edges are in relationship to a 1.618 inch edge. 
all the way around this whole thing. So it's kind of like, to me, it feels like that infinite pattern that we all are associated with of the hexagonal structure that goes on forever um, is now infused with this network, neural network of this phi energy that's associated with it, um, which is the foundation of many, uh, of many things in life, um, as well as the crystalline structure, which is built on hexagon. So you have this fusion of these two, which is often thought of like the pentagon and the hexagon, but here we've gone with hexagons and incorporated phi into that hexa hexagonal lattice. And once again, here I am just kind of experimenting with those patterns. I love to, you know, take an image. I'm not, like I said in the other videos, I'm not some serious trained artist in any of this type at all. I just love the forms, but I find giving them a little bit of flavor and color, seeing what patterns reveal themselves, just staring out this, seeing what triangles make themselves pop out and which ones, you know, settle in. And it, it's not your normal hexagon. It's not your normal triangular pattern. You can go around and count up everything in here, like a tetraxis, and see what's in this. Uh, and it's just giving you a lot of different variety of how, like here's a larger hexagon that's overlapping this hexagon, creating these little diamond shapes. These are the golden hexagons. The cool thing about this is that the actual center of the dividing line, so is actually contained within this. So this little triangle right here in the middle is actually the dead center of this equilateral triangle right here. These little triangles, so, are the 0 0.618, it's because these are the golden hexagons. So this is 0 0.618. These are little one inch triangles. Uh, this here is a, 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 a 1.618 edge with the one inch edge and it's 0 0.618 edge all the way around. So this little thing is just a jam packed full of awesome little sacred geometry, mathematics and phi and um, Anyway, so those are just a few little discoveries along the way that have uh, come up in the, the discovery of the golden chestahedron. And I wanna conclude with the golden chestahedron because I went back to that top view and then I started to um, draw in where those dividing lines are for the various hexagons that I've been talking about. We have the red line, which is your uh, equal edge, one inch edges all the way around the hexagon. So that's your normal shaped hexagon. And then you have the blue one, which is the smaller uh, hexagon. And th then what I discovered about that, the smaller Golton ratio one, that one actually, when you connect it to the, um, the, the triangular faces and the kite faces. So let me explain this in this one. Here's the blue line cutting across the kite face. Here's the dotted line that is cutting across the triangular face that's on the, the back side of that. So here's the triangular face. Here is the kite face. Now this doesn't cut the chestahedron in half, but remember, this is gonna be that spot where it does create the equal edge um, division of the form all the way around creating the equal edge hexagon. So that's in here and that's where that black line is all the way around. So this is the template that is for this form right here. And this is, um, this should be a full triangle if you wanna full, fold it up. So sorry, that's just a hexagon. But uh, you know, if you fold this all up, you'll create this pattern. And normally you see this as a star point, but I started to construct it this way. You should see it like in Frank's book, like the five pointed star and the edges are connected here. But for some reason, I started building it this way. And I said, wow, I wonder what that's going to teach me because I haven't seen it like that uh, in its construction. Cause I always just created a star and then cut out the, you know, the three, th three, uh, three kites and then cut out the, the triangles that are associated with it. And what happened was I put them together um, and this blew me away because what I what the discovery was here was that when you put these together, the division of the uh, the bottom of the kite in relationship to the triangle divided the whole circle into a fifteen pointed star, fifteen edges all the way around, fifteen pointed star, and it was like what a beautiful fusion of 
the sacred geometry of the golden chestahedron, the template itself, the, the actual layout of the template, 100% is right here, all the way around. Uh, so if, if we were like at a party and you know I had this poster on the wall and we're like, hey, you wanna make some chestahedrons and I've got four other people with me, we could just go around and cut out one, two, three, three of these, one, two, three. Well, there's my chestahedron. There's the next person's chestahedron and you're good to go. It's like pizza party, you know, making chestahedrons with this awesome template that perfectly divides it into 15 segments around. And the other cool thing is that, remember that black line, the, the hexagon that I'm talking about in the previous one, this furthest one? Well, that divides the whole chestahedron or this template, this mega template, into 15, uh, I mean, 30, 30 segments all the way around, around because those are all equal edge. So that is just, what, what an awesome form to have just lay out and create the pentadecagon um, formation of the 15-pointed star, which is not one that I have spent a lot of time constructing. It just kind of emerged out of this exploration. And then I just went on to create something like this, which then, you know, just some really got into the, uh, the geometry of the 15 pointed star, coloring in that whole template that we were looking at with uh, various colors. Here's the kites, these are the negative spaces. And I just topped it all off by placing the chestahedron from that vertex view, you know, at the center which is created out of those five relationship circles. So this, you know, this right here, this, this image, um, which is being worked on to be like put on pillows and on t-shirts and things like that. And a lot of my other designs that I'm working with are gonna be coming soon in a little store, uh, little shop people can check out. Um, so we, you know, this is just a, a, a one for one image of the golden, uh, chestahedron at the center of this shape and the template that exists around it. Um, and this, the scale of this is all one for one to the template, to the form in the center. To me, this image um, just like brought it all together in sacred geometry for me to have the template, five of them with the form in the center, uh, with the five based relationships, all the way around with the golden hexagons. I was just, uh, you know, ecstatic and thrilled to have uh, completed this project on the golden chestahedron, which has been going on for over three years now of working with the chestahedron and didn't actually realize that those edges had been modified. So I can realize now why some of my uh, difficulties with working the form and connecting it to some of the other shapes that I've been working with previously had been challenging because I didn't realize that the modified angle was part of that. Um, and then, you know, to come up and discover kind of a dual form that could create and contain the chestahedron inside to figure out how to divide the chestahedron in half to create the little mini ch ch chestahedron down inside, which fits just right in there, you know, down in the, in the center spot, it's a little off center. Um, so, and, and then to, to just link that to the, art forms and the work and to the templates that the form and the designs are all seam line 100%. Um, so yeah, I just another big shout out. Thanks to Frank and his amazing work and his inspiration. Um, and for the new sacred geometry uh, to even go in that direction to keep it, you know, through his, uh, his inspiration throughout all those years and his lectures that I listened to on sacred geometry, you know, just inspiring younger geometries like myself to just uh, have fun with the forms, get creative, let them uh, inform you and teach you and, uh, you know, test everything out and see, see how, what emerges. So yeah, like I said, I was more than excited to bring this video to you. And uh, I've got some other new videos coming up that are gonna go back to the Phi Yantra, which was the pattern I created that had all the platonic solids and uh, that template is new discoveries there that I'm on the heels of and going to be bringing those uh, to you as well, which connects a lot of things together as well. So 
Um, yeah, so those are the major uh, uh, announcements. And the other announcement I wanna add in there is I do have this uh, apprenticeship that I'm doing in two months, starting up here pretty soon uh, at the end of the month. Um, that's gonna be continuing to go on, uh, you know, a thing that I'll be doing regularly throughout the year, uh, in the years in the future. So yeah, please check those out and see if you're interested in uh, joining me for a real deep dive into sacred geometry. I'm really looking forward to sharing some of these uh, techniques and you know getting uh, the creativity flowing and seeing what you get to create in design. So uh, yeah, much love and appreciation. So thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.